Though Lisa Frank is rarely seen and doesn't grant interviews these days, she is, in fact, a real person. Before her signature designs became the desired school supply motif of children and teenagers the world over, Lisa Frank was just another artist with pop art influences and fancy art school training. For those of us from the Gen X and Xennial generations, her talent cannot be underestimated. But what is the story behind the woman whose illustrations are a core memory for many of us who came of age in the 20th century? Let's find out. Lisa Frank comes from a rich family in Bloomfield Hills, Detroit. Bloomfield Hills is ranked one of the top richest cities with a population under 10,000. Her father was in the automotive industry, running Detroit Aluminum and Brass, a publicly traded family company founded by her grandfather and his brothers in 1925. DAB manufactured automatic transmission components, clutches, etc. To put their early success into perspective, DAB was the only company in the USA to make the engine bearings for tanks used in World War II. Both of my folks were into art. My dad was an art collector. My mom had a little kiln in our basement, and we would make pottery. I think from about age five on, they sent me to art classes, and I was a huge colorer. Frank was enrolled into the same private PK-12 preparatory school that Mitt Romney and Selma Blair attended. As a senior, she sold $3,000 worth of her art at an art show. In a rare interview with Foundations, Frank discussed her career beginnings and shared examples of the early, colorful, acrylic paintings that were the hallmark of her style. Lisa Frank's scholars can spot some themes that would emerge more fully in her later work, most notably a fearless use of color. But her success went stratospheric once she honed her entrepreneurial instincts at the University of Arizona. She went to the university to study math and art she says, I think I always wanted to be an artist. I sort of just followed my passion right out of high school and everything kind of evolved for me. When she decided to enroll at the out-of-state university, she recalls, my dad said, that's fine, but you're going to support yourself. I am sure that if I failed, he would have been there for me, but it was a sort of tough love situation. To get by, she started her own business, according to the Arizona Daily Star, by buying pottery and jewelry from area Indian tribes and bringing them home to Michigan to sell. Once the network of artists she met grew, she began to represent them and sell their handmade work. Eventually, she started telling artists what to make, then decided to make things herself. She launched Sticky Fingers, which featured plastic jewelry when she was just 20. It was sold in Neiman Marcus and Bloomingdale's. In 1979, when she was just 24, Frank renamed the company Lisa Frank Inc. because her name was more familiar to those in the industry since her days representing artists, according to the Arizona Daily Star. In her first year of business, Frank sold a $1 million sticker order to Spencer's Gifts. One of Lisa Frank's first designs was a gumball machine. The gumball machine comes from when I was little, Frank told Urban Outfitters. My dad gave me an antique gumball machine, so that was my original logo. And also, you know how when your friends find out you're into something, 
they start sending it to you? So I probably have a huge collection of gumballs somewhere. The company's early designs, she said, were very simplistic. The very first thing we made before stickers were buttons, and since they were so small, we did the artwork very small too. Eventually, the line would expand to include pencils, stationery, folders, lunch boxes, backpacks, trapper keepers, and more. Initially, all of the Lisa Frank art was drawn and colored by hand. When Rondi Coots joined Lisa Frank as an artist in 1987, she did concepts for designs with markers, acrylics, and airbrushing. All of the art back then was done by airbrush, although they did have one computer that the creative director was learning to use, she told Hello Giggles. Then the other artists learned to create the airbrushed look art and started to do all of the illustrations on the computer by 1988-89. Coots, who eventually became Lisa Frank Inc.'s senior designer product development group leader and worked there until 2002, said that she had no patience for the computer, so continued to do concepts as marker renderings which then went to the computer illustrators to clean up and illustrate. There was a stark difference between the 80s and 90s eras of the Lisa Frank universe. The company was advertised much more heavily towards the teenage market in the 80s, and featured much more mature and suggestive designs than the cute dolphins and puppies that were to come later in the 90s. Take for example this design from 1989, a retro 50s Chevy with the reflection of a shapely bikini-clad woman with a surfboard in the hubcap reflection. Or this design from 1988, an older teenage woman staring suggestively at a handsome man over her sunglasses and saying, check him out. Or this design from 1987, inspired by the pop art of Roy Lichtenstein, a couple just moments after a passionate kiss saying, wow. Even this design featuring another young woman deep in her teens declaring, I love to shop alongside illustrations of sports cars, perfume, and jewelry, suggesting she is over 16 years old. And certainly let us not forget this design from 1988, which was inspired by the pinup girls of the 1940s. Overall, those of us who owned Lisa Frank's school supplies in the 80s have very different memories of its appeal compared to those who owned the merchandise in the 90s. Many artists collaborated on the Lisa Frank illustrations. The artwork was a collaborative effort, but it all began with me putting it on paper as a marker rendering. The concepts came from Lisa, James, her husband, or me so I can say that some of the characters were my idea and original design. But by the time it went to an illustrator to redraw it, adding detail, then to the computer artist who rendered it on the computer, which entailed hundreds of hours of work, it had many artist stamps on it. Frank herself said that we have to stop me and say, okay, it's enough, because one illustration can have hundreds of hours in it, it's really kind of madness. Lisa is fanatical about detail, Coots said, but that is what makes her art so extraordinary. There is even a special Lisa Frank ink. We have a proprietary ink formula that I developed really early on so that everything would be brighter. It's typical of a four color process, but we use a special mixture to make those colors. All licensees have to sign a confidentiality agreement because the mixture is a closely guarded secret.
Lisa Frank has two favorite characters. They're the rainbow print leopard and tiger cubs named Hunter and Forrest, who are based off my kids, Frank told Urban Outfitters. Forrest is based on my 13-year-old, and Hunter is a 17-year-old character who was named the day Hunter was born. We had created both characters before the boys were born, and then when they were born we thought, oh my gosh, they really do fit their personalities. Naming two characters after her kids wasn't an isolated event. We actively really try to base our characters off of people who are in our lives, or who have been in our lives, and sometimes it's in memory. We ask people first, Frank said, noting that she based two characters, Casey and Camus, on her first golden retrievers. No one, Frank said, has refused. People are actually begging us. Can you do a character with my name? Marky, one of Frank's first characters, is a unicorn that lives in the clouds above the fantastic world of Lisa Frank, a.k.a. Air Fluff Island. Likes butterflies, exploring, collecting stars, cloud hopping, and dreams, and hates hesitation, bad smells, and bullies. Frank told Urban Outfitters that the unicorn was named after a friend of ours who died super young of a heart attack. Though she said there's probably a little bit of me in each character, Frank told Urban Outfitters that the character that's a lot like her is Priscilla, because she is very into glam and glitz and jewelry and everything very girly. The cat often wears illustrated versions of Frank's own jewelry. Funnily enough, Frank said that she's not a cat person. She prefers dogs. Lisa Frank Inc.'s headquarters is located on South Lisa Frank Avenue in Tucson, Arizona. The Lisa Frank offices have a fireproof vault. There, the company stored copies of everything it had ever made, plus the original artwork that was done before computers. By 2015, Frank's 320,000 square foot facility which features colorful characters inside and out, was mostly empty. According to a 2013 New York Times article, her factory, once bustling with hundreds of employees, has six staff members. Frank's company, a victim of protracted legal battles over ownership and bad manufacturing deals, faded from popular culture. Not an uncommon fate of the animal known as the retail fad. Though shunning the limelight and continuing to lie low, Lisa Frank has been quoted as saying she would love to one day see her artwork be turned into a theme park. So, tell me viewers, would you like to visit a Lisa Frank themed amusement park? Were you an 80s adolescent like me who enjoyed the more provocative designs from back then and proudly rocked them on your school supplies? I'd love to hear from you in the comments. Thanks for watching and good night.